Welcome, Threshold, uh, to the second talk in our series looking at the theme perseverance. Now, the word persevere means to continue in the course of an action, even in the face of difficulty, or with little or no indication of success. Now, all of us have had a, a pretty rough 15 months, and the coming winter is probably going to be a bit bumpy too. And our prayer is that this series helps us to get our hearts and our minds right with God, and that we don't let weariness distract us from sharing the good news. Now, about two years ago, um, Paul and Greg thought it would be a great idea to get a load of guys together and do the Yorkshire Three Peaks Challenge. Now, I don't know if you've done it before, maybe you have, but the Yorkshire Three Peaks uh, takes on the peaks of Penny Ghent, Wernside and Ingleborough, and the challenge is that you do it under 12 hours. Now, there's about 15 of us who signed up and we drove over the night before and stayed in a hostel. And the night before, we uh, took a ceremonious uh, walk to the local curry house and had a few pints. And then it was off to bed for a good night's sleep, which in my case didn't happen because there were two other guys in the room who were snoring their heads off pretty much all night. Anyway, we woke bright and early to a beautiful morning the sun was shining and we were all raring to go. And we did the first peak and then we did the second and we stopped for lunch, we chatted, we shared. You know, we were having just the best time. And about eight hours into the walk, um, we'd arrived at the foot of the final peak. And there, there was this sort of coffee van parked at the bottom uh, of the hill. And we all stopped there and had a rest and a drink just before uh, the last push. And it was about from that point onwards that things went bad, for me at least. Now, many of you know that I have um, atrial fibrillation, which basically means that my heart beats erratically and often quite fast. And this can make me feel faint and a bit out of breath. Anyway, as much as I enjoyed the coffee, about halfway up the hill, the caffeine kicks in and my heart just goes mental. It goes absolutely mad. So it really starts playing up. And it got so bad that I had to sit down and whenever I tried to get up and walk again, I could only do a couple of meters before just feeling completely exhausted and uh, like I was gonna pass out. So there I was on the side of this hill with a load of other guys, uh, conscious that they'd done eight hours of walking and that they were desperate to reach the end in under 12 hours. And here I was sat on the floor with my heart sort of feeling like it was gonna give up. And the annoying thing is that we were so close to the top of the peak, maybe only about another 15 minutes walk. So I was faced with this dilemma. Do I kind of risk a cardiac arrest or do I push on to the top? Anyway, one by one, the guys slowed down and they stopped for me. And one of the chaps came over and he started taking the heavy things out of my backpack and putting them in his. Another chap came over and he gave me an energy bar, which in hindsight probably wasn't a great idea because it made my heart rate worse, but it was a great idea. And another chap came over and started to encourage me with words, you know, to go on, but just take it at a slow pace and that, you know, we'll walk this thing side by side with you. And slowly but surely, I got to the top and the rest was downhill, so it was great. And the best of all was that we did it together in less than 12 hours. We did the challenge. I completed the race, but I couldn't have done it without other people. And you know, without asking, all of these guys kind of helped in their own way. They recognized what their gifting was. You know, for some, it was to lighten the load. For others, it was to encourage. For others, it was to slow down and walk with me for a while. It was just brilliant to see. And today's message is really quite simple. I want us to think about how we can help other people to persevere. Last week, Pete gave us a really good toolkit on how to personally care for ourselves. He reminded us of the importance of prayer, of reading the Bible daily and worshipping. But today I want to look at this from a slightly different angle and just ask the question, how can I help others to keep going? We live in an age of hyper-individualism, don't we? So much of society today is about me, about what makes me happy. And it's kind of leaked into the church a bit. You know, many of the songs that we sing 
a sort of about Jesus, but uh, actually more about my sort of personal struggle. And I, like many others, have been um, guilty of saying things like, well, I didn't get much out of that talk, or I didn't really like that style of worship. You know, these are sort of me-centric perspectives. But the Bible is radical in the way that it preaches about community, about the family of God. We see page after page describing a community of believers who do life together, who learn and love together, who weep together, who rejoice together. They're together through the good times and through the bad. And in the book of Acts, we are told about a group of Christians who prayed together and worshipped together, who shared their possessions, who served the poor together. They were a community who sacrificed things out of love for one another and out of devotion and love for God. It was radical in their day and it's even more radical today. And the Bible is full of encouragements to live in this radical community. 1 Thessalonians 5 to 11, therefore encourage one another to build one another up just as you are doing. Ephesians 5 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 4 32, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 5 to uh, 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Romans 14 verse 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And if we're still not sure about this radical community, think about what Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet. You see, we are God's holy people and God commands us to love him and to love others as our neighbour. There's no place for slander or disunity in this kind of radical community. There's no place for sexual immorality or harsh words. We don't make fun of people in this community and we don't look down on anyone. It's a place where we greet each other with a holy kiss. Hebrews 12 14 to 16 says make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. We are called into radical community. We're all different shapes and sizes, different personalities, but we are one in Jesus. God didn't intend us to be alone or to do life apart from others. You know, the Adam and Eve story in Genesis gives us an allegory to this. God made made Eve because it wasn't good for man to be alone. We're designed for connection. We're made for community. Now, most of you know that I'm a nerd in many, many different ways. And uh, I love watching the BBC documentary Ambulance. Um, I don't know, you've probably seen it. If you haven't, it basically follows ambulance crews across the northwest of England. And it shows you the types of different uh, incidents that they go to and the pressures and the things that they have to deal with. It's really, really interesting. And honestly, it makes you want to take your hat off to the NHS Ambulance Service. They are doing a fabulous job. But one of the things that consistently breaks my heart is just how isolated and lonely so many of the patients are. It seems that very few have the sorts of close and extended families that were typical even 50 years ago. I honestly hadn't realised just how much of an epidemic that loneliness is. It's a largely silent epidemic. It's behind closed doors and it's in every village that we live in. And it's partly why I believe in the two-wing model that we have in Threshold, which is of vibrant Sunday gatherings 
and deeply connected communities. People have the opportunity to walk in off the street if they want to, but they can also belong to something smaller and more intimate where they're known and heard and loved. And threshold is available then at different scales of gathering and at different scales of place. But maybe some of us here today are wrestling with loneliness. You know, the funny thing about loneliness is that you can be in a room full of people and still feel alone. But the Bible speaks powerfully into this epidemic. It gives us a challenge to take our eyes off ourselves and serve one another, both within the church and outside of it. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 26 to 27, it says, Let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at table, or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves. You see, we all need each other. We all need help. But let's not be people who simply absorb other people's time and energy. Let's be people who encourage others. This is a message for us introverts too. You know, I register quite high on the introvert scale. And to be honest, I often find being around people quite exhausting after a short period of time. I need to recharge my batteries on my own. I only have so much capacity, but I do need people. And so do you. You know, there was once a man called Moses, a great leader of an army who went into battle. The battle was fierce and it lasted until sunset, but he only won it with help from his friends. We can read about this story in Exodus 17, verse 8 to 13. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephdim. Moses said to Joshua, Pick out some men and go and fight the Amalekites tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill holding the stick that God gave me to carry. Joshua did as Moses commanded him and went out to fight the Amalekites whom Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his arms, the Israelites won. But when he put his arms down, the Amalekites started winning. When Moses' arms grew tired, Aaron and Hur brought a stone for him to sit on while they stood beside him and held up his arms, holding them steady until the sun went down. In this way, Joshua totally defeated the Amalekites. So I just want to end by asking two very simple questions. And the first is this. Who is holding up your arms? Christianity is not a lone ranger sort of faith. We all need help and it's okay to not be okay. For some of us, it's easy to ask for help. For others, it requires a bit of humility. And we've said it many times before, but it's so important to connect regularly into a threshold community. These are the best places for pastoral care and encouragement. It's also sometimes helpful to find somebody to mentor you, to walk alongside you as well. In my life, I'm very blessed to have Quan as my mentor. And I'm also blessed to belong to a small community of folk who I pray with at different times throughout the week. So if you're not connected, can I encourage you to find a mentor or a community? Get involved with a group of people who can lighten your backpack who can speak encouragement over you when you face difficult times. It's so life-giving, so important. And the second question is simply this. Whose arms are you holding up? Now, I'm going to be blunt here. Don't be that person who just takes, who just turns up when they need something. Be an encourager. Be someone who lifts other people up. Be someone who contributes to the life of the body. You may feel like that you don't have much to offer, but even out of your poverty, you can make difference. In Mark 12, 41 and 55, 
We read of the story of the widow and the mite. He, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few pennies. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury, for they have all contributed from their surplus wealth. But she from her poverty has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. So even today, if you're feeling like you don't have much to give, even just siding up to someone and just asking, how are you? What can I do for you? What can I pray for you? Might change somebody's day completely. So I want to end with just a prayer from the Celtic Evening Prayer for Community. Lord, let your love fill our hearts and minds, that we may love the world with the great love that you have for the world, that we may love you with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, and our neighbour as ourselves. Amen.